Welcome to Online Offscript, where we discuss trending topics and all things new on the internet. I'm Sam Olmsted, Online Optimism's New Orleans Managing Director. And I'm Mira McNitt, the Social Media Director. This week, we are talking about how to create leaders in an organization or community. Our guest today is Stephen Ruther, Executive Director at the New Orleans Regional Leadership Institute. Norley is a nonprofit organization focused on creating a platform and programming for thought leadership and collaboration around issues affecting Southeast Louisiana. Before joining Norley in 2017, Stephen served as CEO at the St. Bernard Chamber of Commerce and a partner at Charter Street Consulting Group, among other positions. Well, thanks for joining us, Stephen. How are you? Hey, I'm doing good. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So just to start off, do you mind kind of elaborating on what you do at Norley and and, uh, what your work and your mission is there? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So I'm the executive director of Norley, which is short for the New Orleans Regional Leadership Institute, which is a little bit of a mouthful, which is why we go by Norley. Um, But essentially, we're a professional development and more specifically, a leadership development program uh, for Southeast Louisiana, the 10 parishes in Southeast Louisiana for individuals who are already leaders within their companies and the nonprofit sector, perhaps uh, running for elected office or serving in the public service realm in some capacity. And so we bring together those individuals uh, through the through a nine month course and essentially teach them about core fundamental civic issues that impact the work that they're doing, as well as give them the opportunity to collaborate, build relationships, and uh, hopefully use those relationships to um, benchmark against one another and um, sort of tighten up all those uh, soft and intangible uh, sort of skill sets and relationships that help make a region thrive and make it so healthy and um, make it have a better future, uh, which is of course what we're all hoping for. So it sounds like if to make sure I got this right. So you take people who already have a talent or are already performing leadership in some way and kind of mold and grow them into bigger leadership abilities. Is that right? Absolutely. And our philosophy is that there's no single leadership sort of profile. And so we meet individuals where they are. And they're obviously to be um, part of our program and to have an interest in our program. They're typically doing outstanding things within their work and within the community. And so we try to create opportunities for them to have greater capacity, greater understanding, and again, really build those networks and expand their relationships so that in whatever way they want to have an impact moving forward, they have an entire network and greater opportunities to do that. Perfect. So what do you think those key steps are for creating leaders within a community? And how do you actually cultivate that interest within Norley? Um, I know that you have a lot of diverse groups of folks that come through the program um, from the public sector, from the private sector, um, and kind of anywhere in between. Um, what are the what are those steps that you take to to help shape those leaders? Yeah, sure. So we've been in existence since 2000, so 23 years now. We have a great legacy of leadership, and obviously. Uh, just uh, around 950 individuals who have participated in our program in that time period. So we have a really strong, huge network of individuals um, who love the program, had a fantastic experience in it, and um, it gave them an opportunity to maybe dig a little bit deeper and learn a little bit more about the region in which they work. My philosophy personally is that anybody has uh, the capabilities of being a leader, right? But not every individual always has that opportunity. And so in my mind, it's really being an individual where they are giving them an opportunity if they so choose to do that, right? If they want it, because not everybody is in a position necessarily where they want that for whatever reasons in their personal or professional life. But assuming an individual is interested in that role, you have to give them an opportunity and then you have to empower them to fully realize their skill sets and the opportunities within um, whatever that challenge uh, might be, right? And so I think there's a couple of other dynamics that come into play, which is that you want to set an individual up for success, right? You want to create an atmosphere or an environment where hopefully um, whatever it is they're trying to do, they can be successful at it. Um, And obviously on the flip side of that, you don't want to put an individual in a position where they're going to fail, right? You want to challenge an individual. You want them to be able to be aspirational and to reach and to work really hard to achieve that, but you want them to hopefully find success at the tail end of it. 
And so my, again, my sort of philosophy in it is that you find an individual, you try to give them the knowledge, the information, the opportunities to challenge themselves, to find that personal and professional growth that allow them to become the best version of themselves. And then you try to create the right atmosphere and have the right circumstances so that they actually achieve that. They build that momentum, they build that self-confidence, and then they can roll that forward into their future endeavors. And I'll just jump in to say that uh, full disclosure, I'm in the Norley class of 2023, um, and it's a fantastic experience. And I think sort of building on what you said, one of the best parts of the experience for me is just the exposure to different people from different groups that I probably would not have met before. Um, and just seeing what they do on a daily basis, they come in on a monthly you know, meeting schedule with their own challenges and what they've been doing for the past few weeks. So you really get a glimpse into the different parishes and the different groups within those parishes. Um, and then, you know, on top of that, seeing um, the curriculum that you put forward um, and how those people react to that knowledge that they learn on that monthly basis as well. It's really interesting. Yeah, Sam, thank you for sharing that. And, um, you know, we're very deliberate in terms of what we do and what I call is it's curating a class. And if you think in your own personal life about the people that you regularly interact with, right, um, your family, your friends, it could be your dentist, could be your veterinarian, could be your coworkers, it could be uh, maybe individuals that you go to church with or whoever the case might be. Typically, your network is a lot more narrow than you might normally think. And when you really try to think about, well, where where is there a great deal of difference in perspective and experiences from my own in my life? Um, I think most of us actually fall pretty short in terms of actually having that. And so we're very deliberate in trying to build out classes where you'll be um, exposed to different perspectives, different ideas. And again, one thing that we always try to encourage is that your personal opinions are based upon your perspectives and experiences that you've had. They're true. They're 100 percent valid. But that does not discredit or devalue someone else's opinion, which is based upon their own personal experiences and perspectives, right? Those things can and should mutually exist. And so that's when I think the true magic of sort of leadership development happens is when you're able to have um, respectful and kind conversations about hard topics and you can share your perspectives and hopefully both parties can have uh, sort of a teachable moment in that process. And Again, it's not about converting or changing anybody's mindset to anything. It's just about becoming more aware of someone else's perspective and maybe incorporating that into your own personal view or thoughts or philosophies when you, uh, you know, encounter uh, an issue or, or a problem in the future. And hopefully you'll be a better decision maker or a better leader of individuals as a result of that. You know, Stephen, you saying how people aren't getting exposed to as much diversity of opinion and experience in their day-to-day -day life. It honestly, so what Sam was saying about how he's coming together with all these different people, I was thinking like, wow, I feel like the last time I really was in that situation was in college um, and being at university and either in organizations or classes and being exposed to all these people who are different from me. And so then when you're like, yeah, like in your day to day life, it's probably not that different. I was like, you're right, because it it was years ago at UNO that I was experiencing that. Um, and I think it's also so important that like to be good leaders, you have to have that um, exposure to other people and their experiences and know how to communicate through and around them. Um, and I think a lot of leaders are missing that um, when they don't have, you know, coaching or like don't work through it through something like this. So can you, are there any like programs or um, kind of like practice events that y'all do to help people navigate how to have those difficult conversations or any like tips that you would give to someone listening? So I think some of the immediate things, you know, and this is a larger statement that isn't meant to be political in nature or anything like that, but we're, we're all very siloed in terms of how we get our media um, how that media, uh, you know, aggregates what we would be interested in and, and obviously pushes into our feed through algorithms, things that it knows is going to keep our attention, right, for an extended period of time. And then when you combine that with sort of political philosophies and, and you know, how you identify with certain issues um, nationally or internationally, it's very easy, um, very suddenly to maybe not getting the full breadth of, again, perspectives or thoughts that, um, you know, I think everybody would benefit from. 
in our program, I, the most essential thing that we do in the beginning is just kind of set the stage and manage expectations and kind of encourage and prepare people that throughout the course of this program, we might have difficult situations. It might be conversations that make you feel uncomfortable. It might be conversations that you're not familiar with. And but we want your active participation in it. That's how you grow. Um, you know, there's a lot of leadership talk and a lot of different TED talks and things of that nature around um, getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I would say that that's certainly true of these sort of dynamic leadership conversations. And I would say beyond that, it's true of any sort of individual who has aspirations of doing something um, meaningful and and of greater depth and experience in their life, right? Um, and it's just kind of the simple thing of if if it's not necessarily a challenge, is it really worth doing, right? Are you really growing in that process? And so again, I think for our program, we just set the stage where these conversations may occur, they most likely will occur, and it's important to be uh, open, honest, and respectful, and again, appreciate that someone else's perspective could inform the way you think um, in ways that you don't yet know. I mean, we don't know what we don't know, right? So just sit down, buckle up, and have an open mind, and let those conversations where they go, and that'll be a healthy dynamic, um, and hopefully a healthy learning opportunity for everybody. But again, to me, it's about managing expectations and the understanding around how those conversations happen. And I just want to jump in to say that, you know, in our last conversation at, at Norley, it was about healthcare. And um, we went to a hospital. The opening panel of the day was a doctor, uh, a healthcare administrator, and a healthcare economist. And they didn't necessarily <laughs> agree on certain <laughs> elements. And it was 9 a.m. It was the first conversation of the day. It sparked a lot of conversation and side chat and, um, you know, follow-up questions afterward. And I think that's sort of what Stephen's mentioning is if it's not difficult, is it worth doing? As in, if these conversations aren't happening because they're too difficult, then you're never going to tackle the underlying issues or the greater, um, you know, things that we face as a 10 parish region. Um, and I think that's kind of the the magic that you talked about as well, Stephen. And and I would say also, I mean, it's a two-part process, right? Number one, you have to right, have the right set of individuals who are participating in that conversation or on that panel. And then the second half of it is you have to ask the right questions that are going to get at these deeper conversations. Now, um, obviously, that's part of my responsibility for my role within the program is to help make sure that we get there, that I have those questions prepared. But what we often find, especially Sam with your class, um, is that a lot of those questions arise organically, right? Because we build the program around trying to address and have conversations around topics that are timely and relevant. And so the class um, leaders are gonna have these same questions no matter who they are and sort of what uh, specialization or field that they're working in, right? So these questions, the questions are just as important as the speakers, but it's really a two-part building process of, having the right people, having the right questions, and then how all those factors interact in order to challenge your own thoughts. So, yeah, I mean, that's, it's a multi-part process to make it happen. You know, I feel like a lot of this doesn't apply only to leaders. Like this can be taken to interpersonal relationships, just like me to my parents, me to someone on my team. Um, it doesn't have to be leaders knowing these questions to ask. So do you have any advice of like how to ask these right questions? Perhaps if it is just interpersonally and someone's like, we have to have the hard conversation, how can I dig into it? What, how, how do you teach people how to come up with these questions? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I would say, first of all, it comes from years of experience of of running events and programs and panels, you kind of learn what falls flat and what kind of um, gets people's creative juices flowing. But I think at, at the core level, it starts with the individual, right? And having, developing your own sense of understanding and agency around whatever topic you're discussing. But the second part is being intellectually uh, curious. So it's very hard to come up with the right questions if you haven't done a certain amount of, of preemptive work. Um, you know, you mentioned how some of this um, could be uh, applicable to families or friends or whatever the circumstances might be. You know, I think when you talk about leadership, one of the most important things that is I talked about us not having a leadership profile. However, I would say probably 99 percent of the time 
um, a leader is an excellent communicator, right? And how that communication happens typically, uh, hopefully, um, honestly and openly and transparently, that dictates a lot of how the conversation is going to go. Um, obviously, people can over communicate to the point of it being burdensome, but I would argue that the vast majority of the time people under communicate and there's a lot of nuance that occurs. And even as we're recording this, you know, there's um, nuance that maybe isn't captured within a webcam, right, of body language, of how uh, we perceive things that you pick up all those subtleties in person. And so communicating and communicating in a healthy way um, and to an adequate amount, I think, is a key part of doing that with family. But again, just being intellectually curious, being willing to engage in the conversation to begin with, and then kind of drawing boundaries on what is or isn't comfortable, or if someone says something um, maybe that is off-putting to you for whatever reason, you can say, you know, I'm really not comfortable with this, but this is why. You know, I don't see things that way. You know, it, it's easy to be reactionary uh, and or defensive and to have a strong statement counterpointing it. But I think the more important thing is to kind of take it in, synthesize it, process it and say, I don't agree with you. And this is why I don't agree with you and why this, you know, aspect of our conversations making me uncomfortable or, or unhappy. So, again, I, I think communicating just in its most basic form is the most important um, part of that process for any leader. And it's a skill that luckily uh, is transferable to all other aspects of your life. So, Stephen, you um, are also a leader. Um, you know, you, you, you train leaders, you run leadership groups, but you're also a leader. And, you know, you're in so many groups and you've been in so many groups, maybe more than anyone I've ever met. And uh, I guess the question is, you know, what role does community involvement, being involved in, you know, nonprofits, sitting on the boards of, of different organizations, um, and just having your hand in all these different areas, what role does that have in leadership creation? And do you kind of need to be the type of person that gets into these type of groups in order to, to really excel as a leader? So first of all, thank you for the kind words. Um, <laughs> you know, even though I've been doing um, this sort of work for quite a while now and have had various leadership roles and responsibilities, it's still very uncomfortable for me. I still feel like an imposter, um, you know, with imposter syndrome in some of these scenarios. But um, I think one of the most important things, if you're a leader, if you engage in those sorts of activities where you give time, treasure, whatever other resources you have, energy, ideas to an organization or to uh, an initiative or a movement, um, you're probably most likely going to be surrounded by individuals who have that same sort of passion for whatever the topic is. And it's no different than if you're a professional athlete or whatever you do in life, you want to be surrounded by um, people who are going to challenge you and people who are there doing all the right things for all the right reasons. So for me, when I became involved on in a lot of these different boards and organizations that I've served on, number one, I learned more about their mission. I learned more about their programs. I learned more about logistics and how do these things happen? How are decisions made within a boardroom setting? Who's included or excluded from those decisions for better or for worse? You know, all the different subtleties, nuance and dynamics that maybe um, you don't see from outside of that boardroom or outside of that committee, um, that all informs how you make decisions and sort of what your leadership style will be and what is or isn't effective, right? In communication, and in uh, leading individuals and inspiring them to do great work. But again, I think the most important thing is everybody has a different philosophy and style to things. You can go into it, you can develop and scratch some of that uh, intellectual curiosity that you have because ultimately you're surrounded um, by a brain trust of individuals who have, again, different backgrounds, different experiences and different expertise and skill sets than you have, right? And then beyond that, you're working with individuals who assumably um, can challenge you to bring out better versions of yourself. And if you're practicing, you don't want to, you know, practice basketball on the individual that you can dunk on all day and beat, you know, 76 to four. You want to play in a competitive game because that's the most fun way of getting better and challenging yourself. And it elevates everybody's game, right? So I, I think serving in that capacity does that. 
um, in a general way. And then the other thing I would say about public service or serving on a board, depending on um, the organization and its mission and vision, is it helps um, you to develop empathy, right, and understanding, not just of your fellow board members, but if you serve um, on the board of a truly charitable organization or uh, a board that has stakeholders in the community, um, that maybe normally you'd be disconnected from, right? Or you just don't have any interaction with. Um, you maybe develop uh, a greater sense of connection, empathy for what individuals go through because now you have an opportunity to interact with those individuals, hear their stories, hear their experiences, understand how it contrasts with your own experiences and thoughts. And, um, and hopefully next time you have to make a decision either within that organization or in the larger realm of the community, you can make a better decision on behalf of everybody who's impacted by that decision. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And it's also uh, a little disheartening that maybe imposter syndrome never goes away, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I think you just kind yeah. of learn to, to live with, you know? <laughs> So we here on Lynn Optimism, we have a kind of like quarterly program that is facilitated by some of our staff members that kind of is to help with professional growth um, for everyone in the company. And this past quarter, our theme was imposter syndrome. Um, so would you give any words of advice to anyone who's earlier in their career so they, they don't have experience and time, uh, but anything that would encourage them in fighting the imposter syndrome? Um, I think, uh, so I, I often think about this Bob Dylan song, which is called My Back Pages. And in it, he's, you know, waxing poetic, all these things in the world um, that he wants to change and, and be involved in. And then the chorus is, um, but I was so much older than I'm younger than that now. Right. And so the idea is that when you're younger, you think you know, you have this ideal vision, you know exactly what needs to be done to solve whatever problems. But kind of as you get older, you realize you know what you don't know, and you're humbled by that. Um, so I think there's a really weird dynamic depending on when, where you are in your career and maybe what life experiences you've, you've had, right, as an individual. Um, I think what I would say for a younger version of me um, and often I was in rooms and I thought, oh, there's no reason I should be in this room with these people. They, they are far more accomplished and knowledgeable than I am. But um, I would end up in these rooms. And I think what I would say is that if you have access to that room um, for any reason, use it for good and, and maybe trust in the fact that you're there for a reason. And maybe you're not the most knowledgeable and maybe you're not the most experienced and maybe you can't add um, the greatest dynamic to the conversation, but you're there for a reason. So just be respectful, understand your role with that and where you can make a positive contribution um, that is constructive, do that. And then I think the flip side is that as you mature in your career and things evolve, um, you just kind of have to settle into it, you know? And I think probably maybe I'm going to spin this in a positive way, which is that maybe the reason I feel like I'm always an imposter, even to this day, even though I get up in front of a room and can deliver a speech or do whatever I have to do. Um, it's because I'm constantly interacting with individuals who, again, challenge me to be a better version of myself, who challenge my own thoughts. I'm personally growing. And so it's very hard to, to feel that confident in the world when you know that there's so much that you don't know. Um, and part of that is, again, surrounding yourself by the right people who not intentionally, not in a malicious way, but constantly remind you just through your conversations with them of how much you don't know about so many different topics. So, um, so I think that's what I would say to the younger me for imposter syndrome. And as you're older, just embrace it as, as a gift that you can be in that space and um, you can continue to learn and become a better version of yourself. We never stop improving. You know, our bodies just slowly give out on us, but our brains, our brains are sharp. <laughs> You know, I think that if you're in a room and you're looking around and you're like, oh, I don't belong with all these people, those people decided you belong in the room. And so if you think that they know what they're doing, you got to know they also know what they're doing by letting you be in the room. Um, I have I have one last question for you about uh, leadership and developing the leadership. Um, what can, and especially because you talked about like being on boards uh, that might 
oversee an organization that has to do with a community that you're not necessarily involved in. What actions can leaders do that build trust with the community or the organization, but without being performative or disingenuous? Yeah. So, you know, a big concept um, that's going around is authentic leadership, right? And there's there's something to that. And And I'll say just kind of my own riff on that concept is just show up, be present, be genuine, you know, and I kind of think it's that simple, you know, um, mean what you say and, and say what you're going to do and then follow through on it. And, you know, it's, I think more times than not, uh, one thing that I've discovered in, in my life and in my career is that sometimes there are really difficult problems or issues that you can't personally tackle right or or even be part of a movement to tackle but sometimes there are things that you can change and i sit there and i think this is ridiculous why hasn't anybody done this before right surely i'm not the first person to see this or think this you know and the reality is that people are in different phases of their lives not everybody has the opportunity or whatever um, to be able to engage in that and so i think it's just being willing to be that person to step up and do it and even if you don't know exactly what you're doing or, or you don't fully understand um, the impact or consequences of your actions, I think it's important to just show up and to make an honest and good contribution where you can. And if it goes a, a little south on you, then you'll learn from that mistake and you improve uh, for yourself in the future. But I think just showing up and being genuine, listening is a very important skill set, active listening being there so that um, people can know, you know, they're making eye contact with you and, and you're hearing what they're saying and you mean it and you're following through on it. And if you can't do that, then maybe wait until you reach a point in your life or your career where you can be present in that way and in that moment. Um, but I think that's the easiest thing, just show up and and do it. I like that answer. And I think that listening is, is usually the answer. <laughs> yeah, I just wanna, I, you, you said earlier um, this line that I, I think about a lot and I think it kind of just ties everything together that you've said is just that you don't know what you don't know. And being conscious of that, I think, can help in a lot of the scenarios that we talked about today. Yeah, well, with, in the in the realm of Google, it's easy for everybody to be an expert. It's much more difficult to sort of say, well, I know I could Google this, but Maybe I ought to go see my cardiologist about this. Maybe I ought to talk to the physicist about this. You know, there are experts in that space. And part of that, um, part of being a good leader, if not a great leader, is having the humility to know that you don't know everything and that those individuals have dedicated um, significant portions of their lives and careers and expertise to knowing what they know. And it's about delegating responsibility when and where it makes sense and deferring to the true experts in that space to help guide you into making better decisions. So, Well, perfect. I wanted to wrap up with, with one kind of last question before we um, close here. And you, Stephen, really have a, a finger on the pulse of Louisiana in terms of the economy, the culture, um, the businesses, and, and the nonprofits and organizations that exist here. So I just want to ask what you're optimistic about in terms of the future of Louisiana, um, the future of our region, uh, and really the future of the people here. I think that's a great question. So, you know, I think Louisiana as a state, I'll take this at a couple of different levels. I think Louisiana state, if you look at us from our natural resources, right, this is a purely economic sort of answer. If you look at us from a natural resource uh, sort of perspective from oil and gas, you can talk about the ports and the port infrastructure, you can talk about timber, you can talk about um, agriculture and aquaculture. Um, you know, we, we, we have a robust and interesting economy, right? That yes, with the oil bust in the late 70s, early 80s, we lost some corporate headquarters, but it's become more diversified to where now we're talking about entrepreneurship around the state. We've been very forward thinking about um, how to support and develop small businesses. And even more recently, we've been very forward thinking about alternative energy sources, right? Everything from wind power to hydrogen to all these sorts of different concepts. So 
I think when you look at our resources, um, there's a lot to be bullish about because a lot of other places don't have that, right? And, you know, I know our existential threat, obviously, is water, either through hurricanes or, or uh, sea level rise, those sorts of things. Um, I think I would rather be in that position trying to fight that than to deal with water scarcity, which is a very big issue in many other parts of the country. So again, I think looking at our natural resources, there's a lot to be excited about. And then I think when you look at innovation and sort of forward thinking um, as a state, but certainly as a region, the greater New Orleans region, um, I think we all felt like for those of us who were here at that time, um, we got a second chance, right? With following Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Rita, Hurricane Isaac, the BP, uh, Deepwater Horizon uh, oil spill, we've had consistently different opportunities to re-envision what the future likes. And not only have we become more resilient, not only have we made investments in hardening our infrastructure, but we've been innovative and forward thinking about, okay, well, how do we deal with these threats in the future? So one thing that I, I love the idea of is that as different coastal communities deal with sea level rise, we have the coastal master plan, which is a huge thing for us. And it's really setting um, the stage for uh, a future that is viable and successful for the state of Louisiana, especially South Louisiana. But it's also a model that many other states haven't yet gotten to yet. And not only have we put in together uh, put uh, together a plan, but we're figuring out how to fund it, realizing that that is a major component of it. So I think when you look at sort of that intellectual innovation, you look at the natural resources, and then you just look at the cultural assets that we have that really buoy up the community and give us our why for being here. Um, I think there's a lot to be bullish about. Um, I know, obviously, major metropolitan areas around the country are suffering now for a variety of different reasons. And I think what I would say is that economically, culturally, um, as well as in terms of human capital, we're actually, I think, right on the precipice or right on the brink of doing really incredible things that can redefine the future of our state. And if they aren't already, um, really act as a beacon of, of hope and, and inspiration for other parts of the country that are similar. Uh, to us. So I, I'm very excited and bullish on the future. We just got to make it happen. It's part of showing up. Absolutely. What, what an answer. I loved all of it. So thank you so much for that. Um, all right. Well, I think we're going to wrap up here. And um, before we go, I just want to ask, um, you know, Stephen, where can people find you, find information about Norley um, and, uh, and follow you on social media? Sure, absolutely. We're we're on all sort of the typical channels, not on TikTok, um, but we are on yet. Facebook. And, <laughs> yet, but we mm -hmm. are. At, I, I won't be doing any fancy, you know, thirty second videos on TikTok. <laughs> but no, we're on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, and we do have a podcast of our own uh, that we do as well called Leadership Dialogues. Um, but the easiest way to really get in touch with us is through our website, norley.org, N-O-R-L-I.org. And from there, it's really, um, you know, kind of the central hub to be able to access us and uh, be able to connect with us through all those other channels. So check out the website, come visit us, and you can always um, send me an email, Stephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N at norley.org, and I'll be glad to sit down and talk with you. Well, perfect. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciated the talk. Uh, I know we learned a lot about what it takes to become a leader and how to cultivate leadership within your own organization or your family. So uh, thank you for that, Stephen. Excellent. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining us today. Be sure to subscribe and rate the podcast. And if there's anything you'd like to hear us discuss, reach out on Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. And as always, stay optimistic. Ooh.